Hello there everybody and welcome to a very special video on the Ellen Pipes here on YouTube. Uh, my name is Jason Rouse and today we are going to be looking at unboxing a set of pipes made by the Taylor Brothers in Philadelphia around sort of 1880. And if you like the video today and you want to help support the channel, you can always hit the like button, hit the subscribe, uh, leave me a comment. Uh, it all helps out a big deal and allows me to sort of grow the channel and uh, provide more interesting bits of information like this. Full disclosure, uh, those of you who know me will know that uh, I've had these pipes for a little bit of time now and uh, I've been playing sort of out and about some, you know, sessions and festivals and events and that sort of thing. So you may have seen me playing them already, uh, but the... The, I actually shot this video whenever I first got them and they've been sort of really, really busy uh, with a backlog of all kinds of bits and pieces. Uh, so I'm sort of putting them up now and you can uh, go through and enjoy my sort of experience of unboxing them. And yeah, so there's actually quite a bit to talk about in this video and uh, I've put like timestamps down below so you can you can go through and uh, if there's a particular thing that you wanted to see or if you just wanted to hear how they sound or whatever, you can skip ahead. Uh, so yeah, it's quite a long video. Uh, apologies in advance, but there's just so much to talk about, and there's such like a like a fantastic, amazing set of pipes, you know. And uh, yeah, uh, maybe the first sort of video documentation of uh, of a Taylor Brothers set of pipes uh, out there. So I hope you all enjoy it, and uh, yeah, sit back, get a cup of tea, and uh, and uh, yeah, enjoy the video. Okay, folks, here we go. The moment we've all been waiting for. <laughs> I get a feeling this is going to be a long one because there's a lot to talk about with this set. Right. Here we go. Oh, yeah, look at that. Yeah, here we are. Now, hmm. <laughs> Where to actually start? Uh, let's start with the chanter. No, wait. There's two chanters. Let's start with... Uh, one of the chanters. <laughs> so this is the original chanter uh, made by the Taylor Brothers. The original chanter with this set was actually a double chanter. So if we have a look here, you can see it's a bit more wider than a standard Ellen Pipes chanter. And yes, there are two separate bores running up there. And there are indeed two reeds up in the top here. So yeah, this is uh, this is a lot of fun. Now, as far as I know, there's only one, uh, I suppose, commercial recording of a double chanter, and that was made by Leo Rosum. Uh, you can hear it on the Drones and Chanters album, and I'm not sure who made that chanter. Maybe it was a Taylor's one, maybe it wasn't. Don't really know. No one knows. I'm trying to find out, but... If you do know, <laughs> let me know. Stick a stick a note in the comments. That would be great, actually. Uh, but yeah, lovely chanter. Um, yeah, it just feels great in the hands. Very um, flat. It's almost like carved, like a, a piece of sculpture. You know, sculpted out of a bit of wood. And yeah, it's you know very slightly scalloped as well, which is a bit unusual for something of this age. But yeah, you got a lovely little thumb rest here, which is kind of typical for the Taylors. Plays really well. I've played this one already. Yeah, I played it before. It's great. Uh, the keys are really big and chunky, sort of classic Taylor style. And yes, there are two holes inside each of these as well. Yeah, so you got your different keys. Okay, the left natural. And yes, two holes inside each of these. Very cool. And then of course we've got two holes at the bottom. <laughs> two bores. They're tinier bores, but there are two of them in there. And you got your classic Taylor's five, like a, you know, a number five on a dice kind of a five stud affair. Uh, and then this is just sprung, reverse sprung like that. So just keeps it open whenever you lift it off your leg. Really, really cool. Um, yeah, so these are very, very, like, I'm a big fan of the Taylor style, obviously, but um, yeah, I just love the key work on this and the fact that if you have a look, there's like, um, uh, just like a piece of metal on the inside here that's literally just used as like a base for the spring you know just to stop it from um, and that's spring in the other one as well yeah like that really cool and yeah sort of classic sort of Taylor style you've got like uh, your 
ivory, bit of silver, ivory on there. And yeah, classic sort of tail that looks all round. You've got this really cool uh, stop key. Something I've always found about the tailors is the, the, the heads are always really quite square, quite chunky. So maybe that's like a good indication of a, re a real sort of tailor head if you've got one of these hanging around. And yeah, they pretty much always did like rounded keys if you ever see them. The, the tops of keys are always round. But yeah, look at that at the top. That is chunky. Now, as it stands, that is miles bigger than anything else that I've ever seen. That's like the biggest sort of chanter uh, cap inlet that uh, I have ever seen. Absolutely huge. And on the actual bag, you can see like it fits quite well. Yeah, that's even bigger. So I think I'll need to get myself like a little adapter for playing different chanters with it because as it stands, I can only really play uh, this chanter cap with it. Yeah. But let's take it off and have a wee look. Oh, what's in here? Oh, this is so cool. <laughs> look at that. Right. Left. Yeah, there we are. Left. Two reeds. And you can see as well, they're quite quite different reeds, to be honest. Yeah. So, very cool. They're both sort of set up slightly differently. Uh, I should point out that the reeds are made by Benedict Kohler. Um and if anyone knows like sort of Benedict's reed making methods, he doesn't really go by specific sort of measurements, whatever. He just sort of feels for the wood and sees, you know, sees what works. Uh, so I guess that's why we have two reeds here that are slightly different. And if you even peek inside, you can see we've got slightly different rushes going up and slightly different tape on them. Yeah, so some notes are taped, some notes got a wee bit of... Uh, bit of wax in there yeah just really really cool sounds great it, it sounds a bit like um like a bit of like a 12 string guitar or like a like a wet concertina where you've got the reed sort of slightly out of uh you know sort of chorusy like you know out of phase with each other i guess yeah really really cool i'll uh i love playing this one it's really really a lot of fun now let's put this Oh yes, actually, before I put it away, uh, let's just talk about the double chanters. So the tailors actually weren't the first to make double chanters. We've seen like double chanters by people like Robert Reed who were making them 100 years, well, maybe like, I suppose, 80 years before the tailors. Uh, people like Michael Egan made double chanters as well. And now they made them in the traditional style. So with the like traditional sort of keys. And if you're doing something like that, if you you need to have like, um, when you press the, the key in with like a, to open the the accidental notes, you need to open up both holes. And like the Robert Reed stuff is just crazy. Like he has like a little tiny, um, almost like a little gear that you press it and it opens up both holes like simultaneously, like either side of the chanter. Very cool stuff. Um, anyway, the Taylor stuff, I don't know if this maybe like was created, designed to sort of facilitate things with the, the double chanters, nobody really knows. But it's very, very cool looking. Yeah, it looks great and it matches the, the regular keys as well in a big way. You know, that sort of lovely, almost like Art Deco sort of style. It's just, just great, lovely bit of work. Incredible uh, bit of worksmanship already just on the chanter, you know. Uh, let's put this one away. And we will have a look at chanter number two. So you got the double chanter made by the Taylors as your your first chanter. And this is the second one. Now... This is a really cool chanter. It's uh, not made by the Taylors, but it's certainly in the Taylor style. Uh, and the Taylors actually made chanters with these traditional keys. Uh, they're sort of referred to commonly as the long block Taylor chanters. And you can see we've got like a long block and that's where the key sits in here, in here you know, down here. Uh, and this was a style adopted by a number of other pipe makers, I suppose, maybe most famously like Matt Kiernan. Uh, you know, a few modern makers make them in this sort of style too. Uh, but yeah, really, really cool. I mean, I, I love this style of chanter as well. Uh, supposedly it was like the early Taylor stuff. So the Taylor brothers, they started making in Ireland or there's a rumor that their father was a pipe maker as well. So maybe this was like inspired by that or maybe this is one that he made. Nobody really knows. Uh, this is a nice, it's a left-handed one actually. Uh, and you'll see why that's important in a minute. Um, but yeah, uh, not quite as fancy as the Taylor's work. Uh, so like the mounts on it are a little bit more 
uh, leave a little bit more to des be desired. That's ivory and this is bone. And you can tell by the grain on it. So yeah, not quite as fancy as ivory, a bit more sort of spotty, I guess. And yeah, this one, the top of it is actually a whole a single piece of bone. So not the usual sort of uh, ivory, silver ivory triplet that you get with the uh, with the Taylor stuff. But we do have the rounded key heads, which is, you know, sort of typical of the Taylors. We've got the little... Uh, popper valve at the bottom, just a single uh, stud on that, not the, the usual five that you get with the tailors. Uh, and this one has like a little screw which you can use to sort of adjust it or whatever. Uh, but yeah, again, a really nice chanter. Uh, this one's also read by Benedict Kohler. Uh, I've got the read for it somewhere. Uh, it's really fun to play. Yeah, a nice, like, you know, single chanter with it. Uh, I mean, one of the theories out there is that the Taylor's made the double chanters as like standard. Uh, so every set went out, got like a double chanter and you can have like a single chanter as, um, as I suppose, uh, an extra if you wanted uh, to go for one of those. Uh, now, I think that maybe the reason that they wanted to do the double chanters is because like, well, the, the main reason for all the Taylor stuff, oh, excuse me, the main reason for all this Taylor stuff happening is uh, a lot of Irish people immigrated to America during the famine or after the famine or whatever and there was a big demand for Irish music uh, in the sort of subsequent years. Uh, There's a lot of sort of vaudeville acts that were um, Irish musicians just to play a little bit of home, you know, uh, for people who would, you know, m most likely never go back to Ireland so they would play some of the old Irish tunes for them. Uh, so those... That situation is much different from the uh, the situation back in Ireland where you'd have like a piper playing in like a kitchen or in a uh, like a house or in a castle or whatever where you you had to entertain like a few a handful of people whereas if you're playing like a vaudeville show you're entertaining like maybe like a hundred two hundred people more so what they tried to do was they they made the pipes smaller and then they opened up certain aspects like the internal like for example on the bore they kept the bore the same as normal and then at the bottom it sort of ballooned out and that gave you like a louder more strident sound so you could play uh, in a big concert hall and people at the back could hear you and they also opened up the tone holes although uh, these holes are still quite small like compared to like modern uh, modern tone holes so yeah that's basically what they did and so the interesting thing about this one um, Okay, I'm gonna put like a big sort of flashing lights up here for this bit. Uh, this is just a rumor and it's probably not true. Uh, apparently the dates don't match up or whatever, but uh, the person who owned the set, Professor Cummings, he was a contemporary of Patsy Toohey, so perhaps the most famous piper of that sort of era. And uh, yeah, one of the, you know, easily the greatest pipers of all time. He, uh, yeah, he gave this chanter to Cummings so this is apparently Patsy Tui's second chanter, his like number two chanter, which he passed on to uh, Professor Cummings. Now, hmm, I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a pretty cool story. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I'm not sure what the what the truth is in that. Like Tui had, um, uh, he played a... a uh, concert set pipes made by the Taylor Brothers as well. It's now belonged to Sean McKiernan, who plays them very, very well. Uh, but yeah, I don't think that he would have had a spare like single chanter and then just give it away to you know Professor Cummings because he only had the double. I mean, don't really know. We'll never know, I suppose. Well, I don't know. Sometimes you have like things like this have have a way of just you know being found out down the years. Somebody will have a you know a written article about it in a local newspaper from a hundred years ago or whatever. Ah, we'll see. So that's the two chanters, both very, very nice. Uh, let's talk about one of the other really cool things about this set. So you'll notice on the side of the stock here, we've got your two regulators, you've got space for your bass regulator here, and then we've got another little hole in here. That is for the big boy. And, oh my God, it weighs a ton. So this is the contrabass regulator. So, <laughs> yeah, this is a lot of fun. And it's a crazy, crazy bit of engineering for just one, two, three notes. So, yeah. Uh, so normally on your regulators, uh, you have like the higher notes. 
you know, uh, C, B, A, G, F sharp, and they go down. Uh, now, this is a really long piece of wood. In fact, if you have a look, you can see it sort of goes up, starts over here, comes all the way down, and then it's just got like a little hitch bend where it loops around and comes all the way back. Now, if this was to be a straight regular, like the bass one, it would be like really, really long, like maybe a meter and a half long, and it would be too much and we would be able to play it because you know you'd have to have your pipes that really low down or whatever now in the past what some of the other pipers have done uh, pipe makers excuse me have done is they've put like an extender on the bottom of the base regular that would spin around and come back up here that way and that's one way around it uh, but what the tailor's done is <laughs> perhaps yeah over engineering it or whatever you want really uh, but a very very cool way of doing it is they put the notes in uh the right way so this is uh your highest lowest uh, sorry highest medium lowest but then they keyed them the other way around so your middle one is still your normal note that's e uh this one down here should be the highest note but it's actually the lowest and when you press it it pops up down here so that opens your f sharp so the one closest to the to the to the reed. So that's your highest one. And then over here we've got the D. And I'll just press this one from behind so you can see how cool this is. So when you press that, it opens there. Down at the back. Right now, how did they do that? Let's have a look a bit closer. This is an insane amount. Oops, have my camera there. An insane amount of work. So when you press it in, there's like a little hinge here, pivoted and another little bit of metal there, keeping that in. And then underneath, we've got another little hinge there. And then that, yeah, look at that. And then that opens the note there. So it's a crazy, crazy, crazy amount of work uh, just for three notes. Whew. But what notes are they? They are the best notes. <laughs> <laughs> really really cool and yeah you got your traditional uh tailor sort of chunky like uh end point ter termination and then you can tune it up and down as well as you're going really really neat you can also bring this in and out and you can move these up and down as well and you can rotate this around for like a different position to sort of make it play a little bit easier or whatever your body type is or whatever uh and it really, yeah, it's really, really quite playable, actually, <laughs> uh, surprisingly enough. And for somebody like me who just like, loves regulators, it's just, you know, best thing in the world. Uh, you've got like a little cradle here as well, which sort of keeps it in place when you're playing. Um, now, the main pipe maker for the contrabass, when people talk about contrabass regulators, the, the main man for the whole thing is... Uh, Richard Lewis O'Mealy, who was a uh, Belfast-based pipe maker, uh, and he took a lot of inspiration from the tailors, and he basically, on the majority of his sets, he would have done away with the little tiny regulator, because he wasn't a fan of them. He's made a couple, but, you know, they weren't his forte, and he would have swapped them out for one of these instead. So you got your big bass, uh, you got your tenor, uh, sorry, your baritone regulator, and then you got the, the normal bass at the bottom. Uh, and he's made some recordings... <laughs> I want to say maybe some of the only recordings of the of the contrabass regulator and he used such incredible effects some of my favorite piping recordings of all time yeah he did some recording for the bbc in the 30s and he was actually in a film as well so well, maybe i'll show a quick clip of that <laughs> So that's the contra bass regulator. Let's talk about this, the normal bass regulator. I maybe I should use this one as an example. Uh, so yeah, so the tailors are very well known for making this sort of flat sheet metal regulator keys. And these are just lovely to play. You know, they're good, they're good size, they're chunky. You can't miss them if you're, you know, in a, in a session or whatever, you're 
you know, blinded by how good the music is and you're sort of bashing away, you won't you won't hit the wrong ones. You know, you you definitely know what you're doing with those. Now they did these in such I, I can't even begin to explain. Just an incredibly difficult way of making them. Uh so we have like the sheet of metal for the regulator. Uh, this is all nickel silver, by the way, and it's very chunky nickel. And if you have a look, you can see even the, the springs are just chunky big springs in there. So, yeah, these have still got a lot of years in them. In fact, they'll probably never wear out to that good. Now, what they did was they bored out the regulators, as you'd expect, uh, as normal. And then they carved the bottom and the sides. They made these little channels. And then they put in these um, little pivot points, little nickel silver uh, sheets of metal that have been like dovetailed perfectly in and then just riveted them. And they are just incredible. It's an incredible feat of work. Uh, yeah. And then these have just been like carved, carved. And let's carve the whole way down. You can see where the light catches it there. And these are 100% flush. If you're on your finger long, you wouldn't even feel where the metal starts and the wood stops. They're just straight, like perfect, 100% perfect. It's just an incredible bit of work in there. And yeah. And of course, all the other metal, even the tubing is like rolled from sheet metal. Like there we go. You can see there's like a seam there. That little line tells you that it was made out of a sheet of metal like a single sheet of metal that was like sort of cur curved over and then like soldered and then hammered on a on a uh, on a bit of steel a mandrel and yeah all the tubing is um tapered as well so it's like bigger one end than the other so it's just yeah crazy bit of work and they've adopted this uh really i mean my favorite kind of style for the the end months really this um based on the work of Michael Egan uh, with these sort of like little trumpets coming out and yeah, just lovely. And you know, everything matches like, you know, the other bits in the regulators all match this as well. And this was something that uh, Leah Rosum borrowed as well, maybe from the Taylors, maybe from Egan. I mean, he was, uh, he was a fan of both and had, you know, did work on sets by both makers and yeah it's, it's what you think of when you think of the sort of quintessential ill and pipe sort of mounts yeah these are great perfect yeah and then you got your lovely tun tuners there you know out and then yeah, i'll just show you in a side here let's have a look uh, it's not great looking uh yeah basically like a bit of uh this is like a bit of a rush and some blue tack to help it out and then basically that moves out and in and that makes the notes that are directly above it uh, flatter or sharper. So yeah, a nice way. I'll get that in. A nice way to. There we go. Just to tune up. It's like a standard classic way. Hasn't really changed much since uh, since the dawn of time. So that's the bass regulator. Uh, this set is particularly cool because it's one of the only Taylor sets that had a. Uh, a straight bass regulator bar and what that means is I'll just get the main stock out for this next bit so most the tailors are really famous for inventing another thing about inland pipes and that was so normally the bass bar goes up here and then it goes up over your arm and like a like a, under your, your elbow sort of goes in under there and it's um uh it can be a bit of a pain to play you're sort of limited to certain positions and but so it's, it's the standard pretty much these days still. Now they invented it something which isn't on this head uh, where the instead of having the base bar, if I can find it, there we go. So instead of having the base bar go like this, they've made one that goes like this. So it comes out here and then rotates back around in itself. And then your reed is kept in here instead. And then that sort of sits flush with the stock and it's much easier to play. Yeah, you can position the regulators anywhere really on the bag and you don't have any issues. Uh, you can have them like across your lap or however you want to play. Uh, it's really, really great. But this one doesn't. And this actually has a funny story. So this is a really, really nice bit of turning as well. A lovely decoration on the ebony, sorry, on the ivory here for this. Now, this isn't the original piece of silver tubing. This was actually made by one of the previous owners, uh, Ted Anderson, because the owner before him had the original uh, the original 
uh, bar for the bass regulator and it didn't fit into his pipes case so what he did was he just like chopped it off and like made it really short and then it didn't work so uh so ted's made this one uh and that's what we've got today and yeah it's a really really snug fit so there's some like awful looking uh ptfe tape on there and there's another read for this somewhere hanging around uh but yeah really 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 cool yeah so i think there's maybe one other set that the tailors made that had like an extended bass regulator uh like that uh now i don't really know if professor cummings was the first uh, owner of these pipes it's probably likely that he isn't uh, he was a piper before so he when he moved to America he he was already a piper and then maybe when he got over there he was like well what's all these cool new pipes I want to get some in, in on this sort of action here instead uh, so maybe he traded in one of his old sets he was supposedly friends of Michael Egan who was a pipe maker uh, in Liverpool at the time uh, so Maybe he had like a nice cool Michael Lee can set that he swapped out for one of these. Uh, or maybe he sold that and then, you know, bought this off somebody or maybe he sold it and bought it brand new. We don't really know. Nobody knows. Uh, but yeah, while we're here, let's have a look at the stock. So this stock is huge. It is so big. It's the biggest stock I think I've ever seen. It weighs an absolute ton as well. It's a chunk of solid wood. Uh, it's just been drilled out for all these different bits and bobs regulators and drones and all that sort of crack and yeah it's it is chunky uh incidentally like the sort of decorative lines on this here are very typical of tailors you'll see most tailor sets are if not all having that uh it's kind of cool you can see where somebody's trying to like prize this open at one stage to try and take it off or whatever or get the stock out there's you know there's a story to tell with this set and for everything of it i suppose yeah so a typical uh drone switch works great uh and yeah there we are we've got the other regulators on there you can see the amazing dovetailing on these and you can see the lovely uh work on the uh on the ivory at the top now the taylor brothers often used ivory at the the, the sort of the, tr the terminating parts of the pipes and then uh, the parts that were towards the actual stock they used bone so these are bone and that's another way to tell if it's like tailored or not you know, a lot of people have sets that look kind of like this but are not actually made by the Taylor brothers uh, one of the first things you can check is is there a mix of ivory and bone or is it all ivory you know or is it all bone so it should be bone at the top uh, sorry, bone by the stock and then at the ends you've got ivory uh, and you can see that here with this little drone if I flip them over we can see it again with a little little tiny drone uh, so this is a bit of an awkward position for the for the baby drone, the tenor drone uh, because you've got to like sort of reach around and fiddle with it but you can't really get at it so the, uh, the person who had this before me good friend Rick had this uh, little handle added in non-destructively it's easily removed but it just had it added in to make it a bit easier for tuning and it just makes makes your life a lot easier uh the other thing that's really cool about the drones is if i bring this one up here this is a triple board base drone so what that means is it's a single piece of wood that goes all the way through and the air comes out here it goes back up into it and then back down around again and it terminates at the bottom. So again, just one of those things where if they had it uh, straight and there are really old sets that have like straight base drones, if it was straight, it would be like, you know, two meters long or whatever. Just having the whole thing up and down and around in itself. Uh, yeah, it just makes things a lot more compact. And yeah, you can sort of see. So that's where it's been like corked off there. So it would normally come out here and then go in there, been corked. And then you got the same at this end. Can I see that? Yeah, there we go. But yeah, very cool. Nice uh, brass and key and reed there too. Very cool. Uh, made by Owen O'Reevy, I believe, who has a fantastic tailor set. Uh, but yeah, it's just a very, very cool, yeah, cool bit of work. Uh, now the tailors weren't the first to do this sort of thing. I think that, in regards to the Ellen pipes, I think that's probably Malcolm McGregor who made really cool pipes. Uh, not anything like the Taylor Brothers pipes, but they sort of 
you know use this uh, uh, this the same sort of thing as that. Uh, let's have a look at the other. I'm running out of space here. Have a look at the other drone. So yeah, here we go. Just uh, you can see the line on the sheet metal there. Absolutely gorgeous bit of work. Yeah, and you know very inspired by Michael Egan. He would have made a lot of pipes with like the, these sort of lines, and yeah. Uh, yeah, just, you know, just the proportions are just perfect as well, you know, as you go down. And yeah, just lovely bit of wood turning on the ivory. Just really nicely made all around. And that brings us to the base drawn, which is just one of the nicest pucks I've ever seen. Yeah, just look at that, a big chunk of ivory. <laughs> this is uh, probably too big to have come from a billiard ball, which a lot of them were. But yeah, just, you know, all the wood on the inside and then wrapped up in a sheet of silver. Uh, ivory and ivory here, just beautiful, beautiful design. And then this little hitch bend, you can sort of see where it's been like folded in and then soldered. And again on the inside, yeah, it's very, very nice. Yeah, so just a beautiful, you know, a very elegant little base uh base drone resonator yeah just very nicely made and again quite weighty seems that like everything in this set is very very weighty now have i missed anything uh, i think that's probably enough of that okay i think that's kind of everything on that one uh let's talk about the bellows so these are the actual original taylor bellows that would have come with the set and you don't see these every day either. Yeah, this is very, very cool. Uh, yeah, there's a bit of brass there. There we go. Uh, so yeah, original Taylor Bellows. Uh, this little cushion is not original. That's from a Killian O'Brien set. Uh, but, and this part here is actually from a Patsy Brown Bellows, but it's just stuck in with some uh, non-destructive glue. Uh, but the rest of it is original. Yeah, it's just absolutely fascinating bit of work and they still yeah they still play really fine uh they've got that sort of weird uh you know flaccid kind of um uh, leather attachment there but if you look inside you might not be able to see it there mm, maybe not there's like a little spring on the inside that sort of keeps it keeps it straight which is kind of cool you don't often see people using those um but that's a nice way to make it make it work properly and yeah it's just a absolutely lovely bellows uh, all stitched so these days most bellows are um like tacked to the side like sort of stapled in as you go whereas in the old days the style was well they didn't have the the, the materials for it i suppose but the style was to uh drill out individual holes as you go and then saddle stitch the the leather to the actual to the wood to the yeah and that is a very labor intensive and if anyone that you know who makes pipes has tried to make something like like this in the bellows they'll tell you it's not worth the time <laughs> pretty much uh but some people still make them and they're very very cool but yeah just a, a crazy amount of work and they drive a hell of a lot of air you know yeah which you kind of need for this set to be honest uh and yeah and there's just like a little little extension that you can pop in there as well if you know you that just uh makes it a bit longer um so you can sort of cut it to whatever size for playing yeah very very cool and also in the case we've got some uh other bits of information let's have a look so we've got some photographs of the man himself And the other one I've got, oh, I've got more than one. Got a big Gaelic event with Professor Cummings, special music by Professor Cummings, the Irish Piper. There we are. So that's him there. And then the last one I've got is a really cool, like, like promo photo or something. Yeah, it's just... Great, there he is with the set, with the original bellows, Professor John J. Cummings. Great looking moustache as well. 
absolute absolute geezer there we go and i have a few other bits and pieces of this one here uh so the person on this for me good friend rick he done like a lot of research and i'll maybe throw a link in the description for the issue of ampibra that he did the the research for so Rick did a lot of detective work on Professor Cummings uh, and he managed to find out like where he was buried and you know his like family members and that sort of thing and he's also managed to track down this which is the certificate of death yeah which is very very cool uh, John Cummings the cause of death was chronic bronchitis not a great way to go 1919 that is very cool yep birthplace Ireland occupation musician <laughs> so I think that's probably enough about looking at the pipes themselves and seeing all the cool gizmos that we've got here let's have a look and see how they play uh, okay so maybe we'll have a little bit of a blast in the pipes in a second I just want to talk a few things about what I've sort of done to get them going uh, I've put like a little adapter on the top here so I can play all the chanters I'm actually playing this with the uh, Patsy Brown chanter which really really suits the set um, yeah, lovely with the chanter and the other two chanters are going well. I'm going to definitely do a video on the on the double chanter at some stage because it's just a fantastic sound, but uh, not for today. <laughs> uh, I've also made like a little uh, extender here. So uh, a little bit of uh, nickel silver tubing because the other one that was made by Ted Anderson, uh, it was such a, like a difficult fit and it was uh, displaying it was sort of a little bit irregular over time uh, so it just felt a bit easier just to have like a new one and it's a little bit longer than the previous one which I think sort of suits the sort of overall size of the pipes. Uh, I had a little bit of trouble with the, the bellows so I've just got a little extender here. Uh, this is made from uh, an old blowpipe and a bit of car heater hose and it just helps the pipes sit better on me so I don't need to put like a shoulder strap on. I don't really like playing a shoulder strap and I try and avoid it especially on like a concert pitch set because um, you know inevitably you sort of like hunch your shoulders trying to play it and it makes it uh, it's bad for your posture you know and I just sort of fix the bellows to make it more like what the originals would have been uh, with the sort of strap strap yourself in. Uh, this one means you can move your arm like sort of backwards and forwards up and down left and right so you've got sort of full range of movement on there and uh, I put like a nice little cover on it this is from uh, a Dave Williams uh, set of pipes and I've also blocked up the um, uh, the extra hole here for the the contrabass reg which I'll do in another video as well which uh, that's going pretty good, but it's a bit overpowering. I need to find like a, maybe a quieter read or some way of making it a little bit quieter. Um, yeah, at the minute the contrabass is is an absolute session killer. It just destroys destroys the session. Uh, so again, this is a little bit of a blowpipe, uh, just to plug it in. All right, so uh, give me a second. I'll get get going and uh, you can have it here like a little blast on these.
for now and uh, I'll uh, maybe get some more videos up in the future with the double chanter with the uh, contrabass but just to give you an idea of how the set sounds and it's uh, yeah really good really big sound love it and thanks for watching everybody and if you like this uh, yeah please do that hit like hit subscribe really really helps out uh, i've started selling prints now as well so you can uh, have a look on uh, a link below for if you want to buy some like piper prints uh, like the one in the background here and if you like the music and you want to help support the channel uh, you can always buy a cd or go on to bandcamp or spotify or whatever and have a listen uh, there's some more links in there for that as well so thanks a lot everyone and i'll see you again soon and we'll do some more videos bye bye